Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Henri Couture. He is calling in from North Carolina, and we are going to talk about an Alzheimer's living will today, something that sounds really important, and it's not something I was even aware of until he contacted me. So thank you for joining me, Henri. Thank you for allowing me to come and share my living will. Awesome. Well, first, tell us about your background. You have 30 years in the care industry, so start us there. Well, in 1984, I actually asked a friend of mine at a Rotary Club what he thought was needed in our community. And he said, adult congregate living facility. I had no idea what that phrase meant. Never did make much sense then nor now. But uh, my wife being a nurse and myself having, uh, we had run a resort in the, in Vermont. We knew the restaurant industry. We knew the hotel industry. We knew all the uh, items in a different industry. So we said, well, it's only two degrees to the right, so let's do it. Especially <laughs> as she was a nurse and we had that background. So that's how we got into it in 1984. when. The industry really was unknown. There was a few mom and pops. But from there, um, ended out having a three-bed, eight-bed, 44-bed, uh, ourselves owned, sold, went and managed for corporate America, um, spent 10 years running an Alzheimer's center in addition to another, another ALF on the property. And um, actually, my last one was opening a 125 resident, five-story, $19 million property. So I've had a fair amount of background in the industry, ombudsman for many years, and very active Florida Healthcare Association, which is where all my experiences were in Central Florida. So um, that's that's where I come from. Awesome. So while you were working in or running one of these communities, Tell us a little bit about the residents and how how you got approached about this living will. Well, before I go to that absolute answer on how as approached, I, I wanted to review how we as a society look at living wills. Okay. And it was kind of frustrating that the living wills were not actively being utilized in the memory care uh, environment that I was in. And I wasn't questioning it. It was just, that's the way it was. And I continued to uh, accept society's implementation of living wills. But as I looked at it, we were not dealing with the Alzheimer's person. We were really dealing with emergent care. So somebody falls, hits their head, you have a brain bleed. Uh, the living will comes into place. Uh, somebody has a stroke. Somebody uh, may have terminal condition. Do we continue with blood transfusions, et cetera, et cetera? And as I went on through it, it just appeared that we really weren't talking about that Alzheimer's person whose mind was totally gone. We weren't looking at it holistically. We were looking at the parts and not the whole person. And although the living wills that exist today could be used, they could be used if the doctor was right, the head nurse was right, the family was right, the perfect scenario, it could come together. But it typically doesn't. So as I was experiencing different things, for instance, I had um, a corporation I worked for bought the home health agency. And it was most interesting that they decided that we needed to have more utilization of home health. We needed more physical therapy, more occupational therapy, more speech therapy, more of everything, primarily for the dollar. Right. I recall that meeting very, very well when I, as executive director, I was told that they were setting a new goal or a goal, not new because the company was new, but a goal of increasing utilization to 50% of my 40 residents. And I was in awe 
as to that goal. Now that goal was not shared during the meeting. It was when I pushed after the meeting to this leader of the team, what are you actually trying to do here? Well, we think we could get at minimum of three, possibly four codes per resident, and we'd have 15 minutes of therapy per resident, 45 minutes, three times a week. And that would just be phenomenal for the company. <laughs> I'm laughing because oh. my mom would not have cooperated with any of that. <laughs> I can see where this is going. So now they wanted nurses and nurses' aides, et cetera, to kind of nudge the nurse, the charge nurse, to ask the doctor, well, maybe we could use PT here. Maybe we could use OT here. Maybe we could. Okay, so that was an experience. And then what happened in America, contiguous society continued to grow as it does today. And most assisted living facilities, certainly in Florida, I don't know about the rest of the country, when a resident falls, hits their head, the owners insist on a 911 call. They want to make sure they're checked out by the medical profession before they allow them to continue to live. Otherwise, you could have a lawsuit. Well, yeah. what happens is that you, you, and it makes sense you know, from litigious society, but from the family, well, you got to pay for another ambulance ride, you know, that kind of thing. It may be covered, part may be covered, or it wasn't, uh, it really wasn't uh, an emergent need by the EMT. Therefore, family's going to pay for the entire cost of that transportation. So, but the owners don't really care that much about it because they're trying to protect themselves from litigation. So, that was impacting how I thought uh, of how living wills are coming into play because when they came out of the hospital, the doctors want to protect themselves, properly so, properly so. So they script PT, OT. And so now you have somebody in sixth or seventh stage dementia, Alzheimer's, and we're going to try and teach them how to walk better, a better gait. Now put your right foot out and make sure you concentrate before you move your left foot. And, and, and the person has no clue, as you well know what I'm talking about. Exactly. So that was another experience. And then I recall one day I walked into my nurse's office and she had a, a lady that was probably 110 pounds. I don't think the weight matters at all, but just picture her. She's into early stages seventh. And she's sitting there just glaring out at the world. She doesn't move her eyes. And my nurse has to prick her finger for insulin check. And I said, Sue, why are we doing this? Well, it's scripted. I said, do you think that this is really going to help her? Well, we need to keep his insulin levels proper. I said, okay, Sue, so what happens if we stop this procedure? We ask the doctor to stop it. So was she going to a coma? I said, then what is the problem with that? <laughs> you not think our creator prepared our brain for natural dying process before we had all these pharmaceutical companies in America? And she's, well, I'm the nurse. I just followed doctor's orders. I said, I understand. So those are some of the experiences I had. And one of them that probably brought it all together was a visit from a man named Homer. Now, many men entered my office on a daily basis and sat, two, sometimes three men, and had the executive look. So they felt comfortable coming into my office and sitting there. And Homer would never speak a word or two, never a phrase, never a sentence. But I remember this one day. This man of six foot three, he had hands that would be envied by an NFL receiver, sat across from me. He looked up at me and he said, life is more than taking a breath. End of quote. He put his huge hands to his face and he started sobbing so loudly that, that you probably hear him throughout the building. I closed the blinds on the window, I remember that, and the door, and I listened to that man sob for 20 minutes. I looked at my watch. It was a profound experience for me when I tagged to that story that Homer never completed a thought process after that, to my knowledge. 
So that stayed with me. So when I had those kinds of experiences, I was probably prone to somebody helping move to the next step. But I wasn't about to do it on my own because I didn't know that I had the capacity or knowledge to continue. So it was on that particular day that these two daughters came in from the Boston area. And they asked me if I could assist them in allowing their mother to die more naturally, less intervention. And I was a little confused at first, but within a few moments, I realized where we were going with this discussion because the staff was trained to do everything they could to make sure that every resident has food intake on a regular basis. Now, that's a good policy. There's nothing wrong with that policy. However, when a resident doesn't want to eat, then the policy says, okay, somebody kind of guides her or him to the chair, somebody prepares the chair, somebody invites them to sit down preparing the food in front of them, or not preparing, but, but placing the food in front of them, talking to them, and then you finally get them to sit down, you push the chair in, you immediately try and start. And that process is all idealistic in some ways, practical in others. And now we have to go back to the individual. And so if you had a Sally sitting there and she doesn't want to eat, her behavior is not appropriate, she wants to push away from the table, well, the the RA, the resident assistant, is going to say, now, Sally, please, please, come on, open your mouth. You know you like this applesauce. And Sally doesn't do anything. Oh, come on, Sally, just for me. Why don't you open up your mouth? Come on, you know it's going to taste good. Please, please. And Sally opens her mouth, and the aide puts the applesauce in her mouth. Now, that seventh-stage resident often talks about swallowing. So now I'd say, oh, come on, Sally, you don't need to swallow this. Now, please, just for me, will you swallow? And that's the process that most times it occurs in the late six, seven stages of, of dementia. So when you look at the holistic part um, comparison, the whole person, the part comparison. Are we really helping a quality, natural dying process when the person doesn't recognize a spouse, a child, is combative, is losing weight, we're wanting to give them insure because they're losing weight and, and we know they're going to continue to lose weight. But businesses, large and small, cash flow is important. Some to break even, some to make a profit, more than others. But across the board, people who operate these entities would prefer a positive cash flow to a negative cash flow. Understandable. That's understandable. So they have this close the back door policy. Don't let the residents leave until it's really their time. Well, who calls the shots as to when is their time? So when these two daughters finished this meeting with me, maybe only eight, 10 minutes. I don't remember. It's not very long. I went out and talked to my aides. I had four on staff at that time. And I said, it's up to you. I am not going to ask you to do anything that you would think is inappropriate. However, given that, if you feel comfortable to allow this mother to walk around without coercing, or maybe that's too strong, but kind of inducing her to sit, she wants to walk. She doesn't want to eat. The food's been presented. It's it's really a nice presentation, and she doesn't want it. Let's let her walk. And when she comes back and if she sees a plate, we're going to feed her. I don't care what time. And that was the request of the daughters. If she doesn't want to eat, let her go. And her body's telling her she doesn't recognize food as a integral part of life. And that's what I started realizing that if you don't realize what food is to you and your sustenance, that says a lot about where your mind is and where your, your whole life has gone because babies are nursing within a few minutes of birth. So mm -hmm. let's, let's just put this in perspective. 
and allow these people to go through this process, this dying process more naturally than what we think as a society is keep all people alive at all costs because oftentimes because of the litigious environment. So uh, that's how the two daughters started the process with me. And um, I recall it was January 9th. I am not a morning person. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, I wake up. I find myself sitting up in bed, look at the clock, and there's three zero zero. I'm wide awake, which is not moi. <laughs> Me either. I thought, what am I doing? Wide awake at three o'clock in the morning. And it was as if a bolt of lightning came down and, and it, the message was clear. Get up, go write a living will specific to Alzheimer's disease. I walked through my house, went to the office. I'd say within 303, the computer was on, and I started my one finger typing. <laughs> and I tell you that I am not one that loves to write, but it was begin. And I then looked at the clock. It was eight o'clock. I stopped, I printed, um, I showered, went to work, arrived at work about nine, and by chance, one of our main primary care physicians was seated in my nurse's office and I had the draft in two, three pages. And I said, doc, uh, would you take a couple minutes look at this? And the two, three minutes went by. I just stood there, didn't move kind of, Oh, am I in trouble since the doctor is now looking at this? <laughs> and he looked up at me after two, three minutes. And his quote was, Henri, where the hell have you been for the last 20 years? End of quote. That was a confirmation, an affirmation that I'll never, ever forget from the one finger typing and not a clue what I was doing at 3.02 <laughs> in the morning. So that's where it came to be. Uh, I called an attorney right away and a friend of mine texted him or not texted, but sent him uh, the draft. And he sent back one of the phrases to put at the top of the living will. I then polished up some phrases and uh, removed any medical um, diagnosis. The doctor said, forget all the diagnosis that you tried to enter. Just take all those paragraphs out and just stay with your, your natural dying the, rather than prolong you know, quality of life. First. And that became the, the living will and um, was published uh, in 2009 and went on a website and um, where do we go from here? Uh, ha how many thoughts? I could read them to you at some point, but you may have some thoughts before I read them to you. Well, I was going to tell you, I don't remember if we discussed this the other day. My mom, my mom died from l lack of food and liquids as a result of late stage Alzheimer's. I had to look up the term on her death certificate because as I've mentioned to other people, I was really glad that her death certificate did acknowledge that she died from Alzheimer's. Cause to me, it's a historical document and I wanted it to be as accurate to what was really going on. Cause so many people die of other things and I don't know if their death certificates actually say, um, you know, they died of X because of Alzheimer's. I, you know, I, haven't, I haven't done a poll. Um, but she, as most people know at this point, she broke her legs and she was bed bound. And she'd had another fall. She fell on March 8th and she had fallen on December 30th. So she was definitely having problems. She was not a fall risk at all. But I had said for a couple of years that if she got pneumonia, I wasn't going to treat it. And that it, if she, you know, I basically, I was the healthcare power of attorney. Uh, my sister and I are co-trustees, but I, I got the singular responsibility for the healthcare for both of our parents, which was good. But um, I would have loved to have had a living will because there were th things that were going on that I did not feel like I could share with my sister because I didn't feel that I could 100% trust that 
she would feel the same way I did. We don't see the world at all the same. So that's not an unrealistic thought. And I wanted, I wanted my mom not to just be prolonged and poked and prodded and all this other stuff. And they went through feeding her and, you know, sweet talking her into eating and all that stuff, like you mentioned. So I've, I've had some experience with that, but she basically gave up and, you know, they didn't, she was on hospice, so I guess that probably helped. But yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer that we should not prolong we should not prolong somebody's dying process. That's for definite sure. Well, that's what this living will does. It gives the person while they're still able to think about their demise to not necessarily depend on an emergent need as living wills do. This says, okay, here's the whole scenario. We're going to talk about food. We're going to talk about therapies. We're going to talk about cash flow. Be careful. One of them is to be careful that there's no exploitation of personal or government funds, government dollars, resources. How often is it? Well, that 50% utilization in that residence of memory care was saying there's more American dollars, Medicare dollars available for this company. The therapists are good people. They want to keep the job, so they're going to do therapy. But when you ask one of them on, on one occasion on the gate, I said, so do you think that this is really going to help? She said, well, while I'm standing next to her, these three times a week, it actually is making a, a, a better walking, a better gait for her. But I have to admit that I don't think she's going to remember it 10 minutes after I walk out the door each and every time. So those are the things I would call exploitation of the resources. Um, and it's unfortunate that our society and our health care has gotten to that point. Definitely need to, we need to pivot away from that. And maybe, maybe our conversation today will help some people do that. So there's some specific things in an Alzheimer's living will that's different than the standard living will. And so can you explain some of those to the folks? Because sure. my I, husband overheard our pre-conversation the other day and he was, he was actually quite interested in what we were discussing and he was impressed. And I don't think any of my podcasts impressed him that much. So. <laughs> well, basically the way I wrote it, uh, and I think somebody was guiding me because, again, I had no clue what I was doing at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I decided to start writing phrases and sentences as if I am speaking to my children that they need to understand that I understand. So I'm, I'm saying, whereas Alzheimer's disease is progressive degenerative. So I'm kind of saying to them, okay, I'm going downhill. So accept that. Don't, don't think I'm coming back. It is progressive <laughs> and degenerative. Okay. It is terminal. It is all at once. We're going to turn this around. Society does come. I thought, well, wait a minute. What would happen if I'm in seventh stage Alzheimer's and they say they have this magic pill? Well, if you can't reverse it, don't keep me in seventh stage. I don't want to be in seventh stage for a year, two, five, ten because you were able to prevent further degeneration. So I then said, well, you'll have a family member that's going to come along and say, oh, we're not sure that mom or dad has Alzheimer's. You know, it could be X, Y, or Z. Well, in a sense, maybe today in the United States and a few other countries, we can, through some technology, now say it's absolute. But... After I went to Disease International World Conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and made that presentation, there was 40 countries that accepted this will. Well, I'm sure that in many of those 40 countries, they don't have the technology to ascertain whether or not it is absolutely Alzheimer's. Now, we've talked about autopsies as being the only way to prove it, but maybe now many countries can prove it without it. So I kept that in the... the the living will because it is throughout the world as a, as a legal document. I had to put in a basis for its implementation. I thought, well, 
what better basis than to use the global scale, the, the deterioration scale? So now all the countries can look at the seven stages and say, okay, we accept this as a, as a, as a globe. So I said, well, now when you are in, when, if I'm signing it, when I am in six, late six is probably where it's really going to happen. But I had to put six because they don't divide six into two. <laughs> so when I'm in six or seven and two medical physicians, licensed physicians just say he's in six or seven, that implements the living will. And then all the decisions, not some, all the decisions are based on quality, not prolonging. Again, the ethical challenge would be, well, we can reverse it. No. If you can absolutely say we can reverse it, fine. But if you can't, live with me and allow me to die naturally. The food part was probably the most difficult one. And I actually changed it after two years. And it dealt deals with food supplements. And that's a very, very touchy issue. I believe that if I'm in sixth or seventh stage and we're, I'm being given food supplements, Ensure or its competitors, it's an attempt to keep me alive. Appropriate for some. But I and Sinus Living Will saying, no, my immune system is breaking down. I'm losing weight, which is standard in Alzheimer's. So don't try and prevent my natural death. So I consider usage of food supplements in my dietary regimen as artificial intervention and undesirable. I consider mechanically altered or textured food as acceptable. So some is having a hard time to swallow. Help them out. Texture the food. Cure it, whatever you need. However, when I cannot or do not recognize, desire, or understand the need for the prepared and presented food or drink as beneficial to sustaining my life, I desire no coercion to feed me be done. That was a direct result of those two daughters from Massachusetts. I had to deal with other things because of what I had seen in the treatments and therapies. So I entered another paragraph, medical procedures, medical treatments, prescribed medications and therapy, not limited to physical, occupational, speech, respiratory. Interventions are not necessarily beneficial to my life. And Alzheimer's disease will likely not allow me to respond with appropriate interaction to receive the short or long-term benefits. The Overall positive value of the intervention may not exist. Then I went to the financial because I saw the cash flow situation close the back door. I request that all parties guard against interventions that may be considered exploitation of personal and government financial resources, not sufficiently considering quality of life versus prolonging life. I consider non-intervention to be humane allowing the natural dying process. I consider palliative care as appropriate, including medications to affect positive behavioral responses. I've looked at it a hundred times or more. I don't know what I would add. I would certainly edit it if somebody came up and said, this should be changed to do such and such, but so far the world has been accepting it very nicely. My goal with my mom was always to do what I could to maintain her quality of life. And it was getting challenging at the end. And I'm grateful that she, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. I'm grateful that she fought with the caregivers, which caused her to slip in the bathroom and break her leg, which was the beginning of the end. She broke her leg on March 8th and passed away on March 31st. So it was 23 days, so just a tiny bit over three weeks. And I'd already been looking for a palliative care company, but because of the COVID pandemic, that was at the very beginning. The company I was working with, they are, they're also a hospice company that took care of my dad. I think they were overwhelmed because we traded voicemails, and then it took another week for the gal to call me back. And by then, 
I'd already contacted a different hospice company with the thought that I didn't think mom was going to die. And I wanted, I knew she needed, I knew everybody needed additional help. And this was the way of getting additional help immediately. And my thought process is once she graduates from hospice, will or yeah, graduates from hospice, I will have been able to implement the palliative care company. Well, that plan didn't work out so well, but, and I wasn't aware of how often they had been feeding her. It, it was becoming more obvious in the last couple of months. And I didn't really know how to go about saying, don't feed her, you know, don't sit there and spoon it in her face. I watched them do that with other residents because how do you know you're not allowing them to starve to death? I mean, I, I know from my grandfather passing away, he had bone cancer. And when your body is shutting down, you just don't need as much food and you don't want as much food. But that's really hard to know. Like my mom walked and talked all the way up until the end. So it would have been a really big challenge to know, are we forcing a starvation? Or are we you know, torturing this poor woman? Are we doing what her body needs? Are we allowing her to die naturally? That would have been a gigantic conversation that I don't know how I would have managed. And, and the care residence she lived in, I think, I think they were a lot more on the natural side of things than all the interventions. And maybe that was because of me. I don't know. I, I'll have to ask them when I can actually go back and visit, <laughs> which I intend to do. I'm going to take one of my, my golden retrievers who likes to go visit with the, the ladies that live there and and go and have a visit because I feel like I've lost touch with everybody because, you know, we, I couldn't go for two weeks before mom died because of the pandemic. And then, you know, obviously we still can't go and I don't have a reason to go. <laughs> so I, 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 I've got questions I want to ask them just because I'm curious. That's kind of my nature, but quality of life is important and it's, it's hard I, to I, know. I think that you just said you believe the staff was on the natural side. And I have found that to be in the 90 percentile without any scientific basis. I haven't counted them, but I would say it's in the 90 percentile. But they've not been given a tool to proceed. That's where you go back to that doctor saying, where have you been? He could have used it. He wanted it. And... Most physicians want it, but they don't want to bring it up and then be liable. So it's important that we, as individuals, are in control of our own future and state that. Uh, so I actually uh, think that those two daughters did a wonderful gift, gave a, had a wonderful gift to the world. And then when I was uh, leaving the... Uh, on the chairperson uh, at the closing session thanked me for bringing this living wheel to the attention of the world. And to me, that was a major stamp of approval as to how society wants an answer that had not yet been provided. I definitely think that society and humans have not caught up to science and technology just yet. We're going to have to hurry it up because technology changes so quickly. I mean, there used to be back, you know, let's see, my great grandmother on my dad's side had a pacemaker inserted. She had an irregular heartbeat, totally healthy. Has this pacemaker put in her chest, 1978. She could feel it and it freaked her out. This is a lady that traveled across the country in a covered wagon she lived in a dugout, so this was, you know, for people listening that are my age and older, this was like Little House on the Prairie days, and she was not comfortable with feeling this pacemaker and being reliant on this piece of technology to keep her alive, and she just basically curled up and gave up and died, and that was the whole point of putting the pacemaker in was to prevent that, but she was not comfortable with that thought. So it's just really interesting. Think back, you know, a pacemaker was, I mean, all she needed was to regulate her heartbeat. It wasn't, you know, like she had a 
a major heart, you know, congestive heart failure or anything. So it's just, I find it really fascinating. And, you know, there are, I've met people that they want everything done to save their, their spouse. Usually it's a spouse and sometimes it's parents, you know, they're not ready to let them go. And I always found that really frustrating because I, my mom had been on the Alzheimer's journey for about 20 years. And I had stated in many podcasts that I was ready for the journey to be over very definitively was positively sure I was ready for it to be over. And then when it was over, I was quite surprised uh, that I was less ready than I thought it was. It was very, it's always a shock. No matter. You can't be emotionally always ready. Either. That's true. And it, yeah, and it did happen. I was really on a TV program with a, I um, didn't mean to cut in. I, I was on a TV program with a, the attorney and uh John Feldman and John said of the thousands of cases that he or people clients he dealt with in his career as a elder law and and uh, other situations dealing with living wills and whatever it might be he said not a one in the thousands he dealt with ever wanted to have poor quality of life at the end he said however nobody has had this answer and so we as a society, I think, want it, but we've just not been blessed those two daughters to say, let's push this issue and uh, proceed with it. Well, it's definitely so hard to know. Yeah. And if anybody's interested. Go ahead. Well, Go ahead. I mean, <laughs> we're having an internet lag here a little bit. I, I'm grateful for those two daughters to enter your life and for whatever inspiration struck you at 3 a.m. Because I, I feel it's really hard to know, am I providing quality of life for this person or am I just sustaining them in a less than type of life? That's where I was at with my mom. And like I said, I'm very grateful that she took most of the decisions out of my hands. So where can people buy this living will because i think we all need to have it my husband and i are in the process of doing our trust it is. so we'll be definitely it is on my website alzheimer's living will.com that is hot link and in the show it notes. is a standalone document or an addendum they, they can just their existing living will, if they want it as an addendum or if they didn't have one, this can be used as a standalone do document. And people in the early stages, even mid stages of Alzheimer's can sign it. They have lucid days. They have days when they've talked to the kids and say, please don't, please don't do such and such. Yeah. And at that time they could sign it. Makes so sense. I think this I'm, is beneficial to hundreds I, sorry. and thousands of people. Like I said, we're having a little bit of a slow internet connection today, but this was such an important topic that we powered through our technology challenges today. And I think it's important because I think none of us has a clue what tomorrow will bring, what next week will bring. If 2020 has not proven that to everybody, well, then I can't help you. But we need to plan ahead, you know, get this Alzheimer's living will and get it, you know, handle it the way they need to be handled with your, your legal and all that good stuff, because you'll, you'll be happy that you did it. And if you don't ever have to use it, that's even better. Jen, and if anybody wanted to contact me directly to ask questions, I would welcome them to contact me. Sorry, H E N R I P is in Paul, then couture C O U T U R E at Gmail. Dot com and I would welcome questions and hopefully I can answer them. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that's also in the show notes. Hopefully your email inbox does not explode. <laughs> and I really appreciate this. And as I said, I'm very grateful for those two daughters inspiring you to wake up at 3 a.m. and write this Alzheimer's living will just to make life better for everybody. Cause that's, that's something I think we all need to start focusing on is how can we take care of ourselves and take care of our, our community and we'll be a better world when we do that. Thank you, Jen, for 
asking me to be part of your podcast. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.